so you fixed say. points in a renormalization group flow or something in condensed matter. Mm -hmm. Is this related at all to the the bare parameters in the quantum field theory? I don't know. It may be. Okay. Any other question? <laughs> so is there any concept of scale invariance in these quantum field theories and how is it? Well, um, yeah, and I, 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 I hope we'll get to that later. But if it's not something else, we'll talk about it. I mean, it can't, be a f it can't really be a physical scale in the way we present it, because we've assumed that there's some, there's some really small distance, right? Yeah. For which this theory is no longer an effective theory, and so in that sense, like spatial scale invariance doesn't seem to make sense. It would have to be the scale of something else. Not the, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So what? <laughs> Maybe we'll answer your, to answer your question. What I'm going to try to do today is, I, I think, um, I think I've been. Well, I've been following Weinberg, but I thought I could skip chapter 10 and just do 11. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to. I don't want to do the whole chapter of homology because it's 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 um, you know, as a friend of mine said, Weinberg has all the notes. Of music. Um, just ain't on the toilet. All right, let's go back to the simplest case, namely scalar. Um, uh, a scalar theory, just a single scale field. And it starts out uh, like this. There's a Lagrangian with all sorts of constants and scale factors that um, aren't necessarily uh, the same as the ones we use in, in the physical, in, in lowest order. So in other words, we'd say that this phi b, the bare field, is some constant times the renormalized field. The square of the bare mass is the mass squared minus some shift delta m squared. And so this is then the physical mass. This field is, is the one such that if this is a state of um, one quantum of momentum p, where a of P, a dagger of Q, is delta Q to P minus Q, um, then the, this renormalized field, phi of X, again Weinberg's notation, square root 2 pi Q, 2 P0, A of P, E to the I P X plus the dagger of P minus i p x. So in other words, the, the matrix element of vacuum renormalized field physical state of momentum p is just then um, e to the i p x over square root of 2 pi q. In other words, it's the sort of thing that we've been using in the past in, in, in doing perturbation theory without any loops. Um, so then we write the same Lagrangian L as L0 plus L1, and now L0 is um, minus. Uh, minus a half, it's just the one that, we, that we've been using all along, minus a half 
m squared pi squared, and then L1 has these very has the interaction term plus the various counter terms, and so this is minus a half z minus minus one. By the way, is can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. By the way, thanks for the help of the boards. And okay, and this V of V is defined as V bare of square root of z feet. Okay, so now we imagine that there's something that the full propagator is the ordinary propagated lowest order plus lowest order some sort of a um, a sum of all sorts of graphs so these the types of loops that you could get so maybe that's not true i mean it's going to depend obviously on the interaction well, with the lagrange right term. right right this is not meant to be a loop okay this so it could be it could be it's something whatever's allowed by the interaction this is th th this thing is what's called one particle Irreducible. It's the sum of all one particle irreducible graphs of the form something's coming in, something's coming in, and then whatever, and then something goes out. But whatever is definitely controlled by the form of the interaction in the Lagrangian. Yeah, whatever it's absolutely it's controlled by the V, and the idea is that the only things that can't be in here. So another let, let, let's let's um, look at a theory five cubes, say for simplicity. All right, then one diagram of course would be a simple loop, mm -hmm. and this is one particle irreducible because if you cut this, it's still a connected diagram. If you cut one line. You have to cut two lines to subtract, to, to, to separate it. That's what one particle irreducible means. Okay. But you could also have see that's also one particle irreducible. And then you could add another loop here, and you could have something go across there, and you could have something here, and something over there. So you can do you, you, you so it's the sum of all those things is what is that's written. included in there. Yeah. Okay. And so it's it's kind of an absurdly ambitious thing to write it that way. <laughs> the reason people do it is that you've got effectively a geometric series here. And one reason why it's a geometric series is that is that if you have, I mean, you can think of this as as I mean, this is the propagator. So if a particle starts out with momentum P, it ends up with momentum P. And so here, also, this thing has to take you from momentum P to momentum P. May not, P may not be on the mass shell, but it's still the case that you're going from P to P. So, this, so everything is at the same momentum here. The inside the loop, you have anything. So why don't but you have outside the loop? Everything has to be in momentum p. So why can the outside lines be off the mass shell? I guess that. Oh, because this yeah, this yeah, can yeah. be a well. For example, the, the the propagator here is one over right. p squared plus m squared right. minus i epsilon, and so if if yeah. p is on the mass shell, then it's infinite, which is. 
probably his way of telling us that that's where the part was supposed to be. If that's moving really. Okay, so everything is really a function of p, and so this thing is is delta prime of p is delta of p plus pi star y. Sorry, it's not pi star. It's delta pi star delta. Well, let me not put this p because it's it's just going to be so. squared plus dot dot dot. And so finally you write this as delta times 1 plus, well, just the sum, pi star delta to the n, n equals 0 to infinity, and so this is delta 1 over 1 minus pi star delta, and, well, delta is 1 over, uh, what are we, are we talking P or Q? I don't even let me look at the notes here. So we've mentioned analytic continuation a few times, but is that what you have to do in order to formally write this geometric series as this other one? I mean, no, I don't think, I know everything's real here. Um, let's, I'm, I'm, I'm using Q instead of P, so let me just say delta of Q is 1 over Q squared but you know, even in a complex case for geometric series, the... Oh, yeah, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. The, as long as this is less than 1 in absolute value. Right. But do we know that that thing's less than 1 in absolute value? I guess that's my question. And is, if it's not, then isn't that the case where we've analytically continued? All right. You're, you're, all right. Very good. You're right. Right there. You're right. Okay. Even here, we're fooling around. Right. Okay. So there's, there's some analytic continuation even there. So anyway, this thing is q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon, and then we have 1 over 1 minus pi star divided by q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon, and then the thing becomes delta prime is 1 over q squared plus m squared minus pi star minus i epsilon. So it takes this nice simple form. Again, as you say, effectively we're, and we're, we're, we're sort of fooling around even here. And whether there's something wrong with that, I don't know. Um, let's see. Well, all right, here's the sort of thought that if, if pi star is already renormalized, then in electrodynamics, it's multiplied by e squared, which is like 1 over 137. And yeah, at least e squared, right? Because it could be e to the... Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The different terms the, be given small. Right. Of course, we're talking here as a scalar field theory. So if we imagine it's phi cubed or lambda phi to the fourth, then, and lambda is sufficiently small, hmm. then you can say, well, that's the case. But of course, for large Q, well, it depends on how pi star depends upon Q. So anyway, very good observation. And, um, I'm really not sure what to say. All right, so that is that. Now, what I thought, what I thought I would do would be something that's sort of related to your homework problem. Namely, let's bring in these counter terms and see how they contribute. Well, what we're talking about here is Q prime e to the, or if you want, time order product, e to the i over two, z delta m squared, for example, integral phi squared, e to the x q. I have a real students. Our meaning translates. This is probably still with our advisor, and then, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe that, maybe the last 
architecture was a little bit too much. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right. Um, so if we do this, then we see to lowest order, this is i over 2z delta m squared q prime integral phi squared of x q fourth x q. And this is i over 2z delta m squared uh, 0 a of q prime and uh, integral phi squared of x d4 of x a dagger of q vacuum. And then you substitute the phi across this formula for phi and um, what you get is i over, well, uh, there's a once again, you have that one of the phi's, either one of the phi's can couple, can cancel this creation operator. So you get a factor of two. And so it's i z delta m squared. And then uh, what's left is an integral e to the minus i x q prime plus i x q d4 of x over 2 pi q root prime zero to q zero. And um, so this is pi pi over q zero z delta m squared delta four of q prime minus q. So that's the that's what that term gives you. And what we're doing here is we're factoring out um, the delta function and I guess the i over q zero. Because if we do the other term, we have q prime time order of power e to the minus i over two z minus one integral d mu phi d mu phi plus m squared <coughs> p squared p four x q. So this calculation we just did is just telling us that this sort of modified mass term isn't going to change the momentum. Well, it's not going to change the momentum, right. But, um, well, none of these things change the momentum. The point right, is right. that this makes a contribution to right. um, to the uh, to double prime, let's say. So, Anyway, this is a, a, essentially the same calculation, minus i, z minus 1. And now we have minus i, q prime mu, i, q mu, plus m squared, uh, delta 4, q prime minus q, 2 pi to the 4, over 2 pi q, 2 q 0. And so this is minus i, pi over q 0 q squared plus m squared z minus 1 delta 4 q prime minus 2. All right, and so you compare these two, and what you have is effectively I'm computing, I'm computing effectively pi star. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure why I'm going to actually get the pi star at this point because pi star is supposed to be one particle reducible and these are, these are anything, these are certainly reducible um, diagrams. So I guess what I'm doing is computing um, uh, delta. Let me just see here. I haven't really been following these. plus z 
delta m squared plus pi star blue of q squared. Um, and now you want that this pi star of minus m squared should be zero. And well, if q squared is minus m squared, this term immediately vanishes. So what you get is that um, that uh, z delta m squared plus pi star root of minus m squared is zero. And you also want the derivative of this with respect to q squared to vanish because that would, um, that would change the residue. In other words, if, if, if pi star is a constant, it changes the mass. If pi star at minus m squared is a constant, it changes the mass. If pi star at minus m squared is, um, has a term proportional to q squared, then um, it would change this residue. And so, um, one gets the other condition, which is minus z minus 1 plus d e pi star dq squared minus m squared is 0. And so this tells you that z is 1 plus d dq squared of pi star root of q squared and q squared minus m squared. So, and the pi star loop is what we calculated last time for the case of electrodynamics after we normalize them and so forth. And, um, okay, now, I must say, I'm a little puzzled here um, as to why these terms are coming into pi star. something here that I'm going to try, I'm going to have to figure out, but in any event, this, this is what Weinberg wrote down, so let me guess it's unlikely to be wrong. Um, all right, let me do the spinner case now. It's the same, the same business, uh, minus psi, bear d slash plus m bear psi bear minus v bear psi bar psi bear. Okay. And then we said psi bear is the square root of now z2 psi. And the reason for that is that um, in, the, in the scalar theory, typically the scalar theories that one talks about, there's only a single scalar field. And uh, so you just have one. See, when you have a spinner field, usually you have a, a gauge field with it. And so you have a, a Z for that. Then you have MB is M minus delta M. And so then L0 here is minus psi bar D slash plus M psi. So this is this is sort of a spinner field interacting with itself, and unfortunately, such fields are normally not normalized anyway. Um, so in general, the boundary conditions are sufficient to solve for the and what, are, what is the role of these boundary conditions? These boundary conditions, okay, these, these, these conditions on the pi star should, balance, uh, should vanish on the mass shell, and that its derivative should vanish on the mass shell. Those are two conditions which tell us something about what delta m squared is and what z, what z delta m squared is and what z is. And so when we compute this thing, this pi star loop, 
is if we compute it, say, with dimensional regularization, this will start to have poles as d goes to 4, as the dimension of space time goes to 4. And when those poles occur, we'll say that z, we'll use z to cancel the pole. So we, this, these equations allow us to determine what z and delta m squared are so as to consistently cancel the divergences in pi star loop and other things. There's another thing that's important uh, in electrodynamics, which is a, a vertex function, which we'll get to. Did I answer that? Yeah, that's fine. I owe you a chunk. here is minus z2 minus 1 psi bar d slash plus m psi plus z2 delta m psi bar psi minus bb z2 psi bar psi. So these are our, our counter terms. Now once again we have a, a complete propagator S prime of k, we're saying the momentum is k here, is S of k plus, and now we're writing it as S sigma star S, again, of k. And then um, plus S sigma star S, sigma star S, and so forth. So again, these are one part of the reducible and one gets s over 1, over s times 1 over 1 minus sigma star s. Now this lowest order propagator, s of k, is minus i k slash plus m. It's a matrix, really, so these are all matrices. Minus i k slash plus m over k squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And this is often written as 1 over i k slash plus m minus i epsilon. And the reason is that um, minus i k slash plus m times i k slash plus m minus i epsilon. And we say that this is equal to k squared plus m squared minus i m epsilon. And then this, I don't know, this is minus i k slash, which I'm, we're throwing away. Um, it, it may be a cute way of canceling them, but in any event. Um, so now, what we have is that this s prime, uh, which is given by this expression, is then 1 over um, I k slash plus m minus sigma star minus I epsilon. So that's that's the I. And now once again if sigma star is equal to minus z2 minus 1 i k slash plus m plus z2 delta m plus sigma star root of k slash. And we want sigma star of i m. Now, Sigma star is really a function of, you can think of it as a function of k, which is a four vector, so that's k mu. Or you can think of it as a function of k slash, because in fact, it is a function of k slash. Uh, 
So where, and when we say that when we replace, so in other words, the variable here could be k mu, could be k slash, and sometimes one says, one says, well, k slash is I m. Well, what's meant there is that k slash squared, um, if k slash is equal to I m, then this is minus m squared. And so in other words, k slash equal to I m is, a, is another way of saying that k mu, k, that k squared is minus m squared. So it's just it being on the mass shot. Well, I'm going to turn the lights on now the car on. It's really annoying me that we're having lectures in the turn out. Uh Yeah, don't we're, we're going green. That's helpful. Well that's how Professor feels. I mean this is winter and the photons are used to keep the building also. <laughs> but I mean it's just depressing when we turn out the lights when the store. So we get that solid lights. state lighting. Huh? That, that's true until we get that solid state lighting. Yeah, well, that would be good. <laughs> okay, so, um, so the conditions here are that when k is on the mass show, we want sigma star to vanish. We also want the derivative of sigma star with respect to k to vanish when k is on the mass show. And as I said, sigma star is really a function you can think of it as a function of k mu or as a function of k slash because of just the, the, the way these gamma uh, matrices uh, work out. And so the rule, what we say then is that this is equal to zero, sigma star of i m is equal to zero, and partial of sigma star of k slash with respect to k slash for k slash equal to i m is equal to zero. Now, k slash, of course, is a four by four matrix. It can't be equal to i m because these gammas are linearly independent. What is meant here is that um, it really is just means that k is on the mesh. That's all it means. And what is true is that if you have a spinner u of k, then k slash on that will equal i m u of k, but that's because k slash that u is an eigenvector of k slash with eigenvalue i m. So you said there was a, some trick for so I sort of don't buy the equality there because of that minus epsilon k slash. That's all right. So yeah. what's what's the deal with that? All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay. okay. Set epsilon equal to zero, then the thing is obviously right. Yes. The point of, the, of this is just to tell you how to go around the pole, and this thing tells you to go around the pole the so same way. It's just going to make you go, yeah, okay. It's just going to draw the pole further down, I guess. Yeah, in fact, whenever you actually use this, what you do is you replace it with that. Mm. Because, you know, who knows how to integrate one over a matrix. You don't do that. <laughs> you, you do this and you take the trace and numerator. That's what we did in yeah. a couple of classes. Good question. Do you, do you want another? No. Now, there is, there is something uh, Im important to say here. This is, let's go back over here. This is the full, I mean, after we bring all the lines and so on and so forth, this is the formula for the full propagator for the scalar boson. What this is telling us is that when Q squared is near minus M squared, as we approach the mass shell, we can ignore pi star because it has, um, it's zero, on the mass shell, and it's even its derivative is zero on the mass shell. And so it has almost no effect on the mass shell. Right. Moreover, the same thing is true here. 
that for the fermion, here we're talking about the full fermion propagator. So this is the, the real fermion propagator. And what we're saying here is that this real fermion propagator is the same as the free fermion propagator when the fermion is on the mesh show, when p squared is minus m squared. And um, in particular, that means that in both theories, you can ignore radiative corrections to external lines. So in other words, if you have a diagram where, let's say, an electron is coming in, another electron is coming in, and um, say it exchanges a photon, comes out. Well, corrections here, all of these we can ignore. And if this photon also, this photon, um, was on the mass shell, we could ignore the corrections to the photon. So, aren't all tree level diagrams like this okay? Because the. Well, that the, is a tree level diagram. Yeah. The internal momenta is fixed by whatever the external ones well, are. Well, 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 look, here. Right, right. All right. Now it's no longer tree level. Now, here, this guy. Yeah, yeah. Can't ignore this guy. Good point. All right, so that's that. Um, now, I don't know if I should mention this. Uh, I was, I included this to remind uh, the students about symmetry. This is one of these nice things about symmetry. You want to see this again? I love symmetry. All right. <laughs> So this is the case where the Lagrange density is the same. This is the simplest case. In other words, you have a transformation psi i prime is psi i plus delta psi i. And d mu psi i prime is, of course, d mu psi i plus d mu delta psi i. And under such a transformation, L prime is the same as L. This is a local symmetry, right? At each space-time point? It could be, or it could be global. It, it, it. So using the derivatives, I don't, I don't sort think, of... I, I don't think it makes any difference okay. at this point, because delta... Yeah, you're right, delta psi... I mean, having the derivative... I wrote a delta psi of x, right. it could be local, sure. You're absolutely right. Now, what we get then is zero is the change in the Lagrangian, which is partial over uh, the change in Lagrange density, partial Lagrange density with respect to psi i, change in psi i, partial Lagrange density with respect to d mu psi i, change in d mu psi i. <coughs> And so we have zero is, now notice that the change in d mu psi i is the derivative of the change in psi i. So we can rewrite this as partial L, partial psi i, change in psi i, plus partial L, partial d mu psi i, d mu partial, d mu change in psi i. And now we have Lagrange's equations. So, so far, it's general. But now we're assuming Lagrange's equations, which is partial L, partial psi i, is d mu, partial L, partial d mu, psi i. If we assume Lagrange's equations, then this becomes 0 is d mu partial of Lagrange density partial d mu psi i. So in other words, we're sort of taking it a step backwards. We're, we have something that's quite simple. We're replacing it by something more complicated. Are we missing a, a delta? All right, wait a minute. Oh. 
Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Oh, that's you. not where I meant. But. <laughs> oh. So in the last line on the left-hand side. Last line on the left-hand left side, left, zero. No, the left board. I mean, so the very last thing is a, is a delta. The change in the Lagrangian is right. zero. So the very last thing is a delta d mu psi i. Right. And then are we replacing that d mu psi i with, like? D mu delta psi i because of this. But if there's, there's another delta still there, right? Does that matter? I'm completely baffled. Where is the sixth delta? Hmm. <laughs> hey, maybe I'm wrong. Well, no, I'm, I'm sure you're right. right. I just don't know what you're looking at. I mean, are we replacing this with this? So in no, this no, 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 okay. no! No, no, no! This is d mu of psi i prime is almost the same as d mu psi i. It just differs by this. Ah. This followed from this slide. I see. Just differentiate. Yeah. No, no. I think the primes. That was the primes. But then what this tells you is that the change in d mu psi i is equal to d mu of the change in right. psi i. Right. When I was a student, the professors always skipped this step and always bothered. <laughs> I just have one question about this thing. So when you said this, uh, so if I have this matrix form, right, and I can have these uh, constants, these z2s being two different constants multiplying the two parts of the key, right, which is a vector equation. So you mean then, you wanted to have, since psi is a four-component spinner, you wanted to have four different z's? Yeah. That people don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my question is... I mean, you could maybe, but people, I've never heard people do that. Yeah, I guess that is because you probably don't have different mass terms, and generally there will be as many z's as you have the masses, right? Because well, have yeah, so we'd have to have as many, at least as many z's as masses, but there's only... You want to have a, a, the small component spinner all has the same mass. Yeah, no, but in general, I mean, just purely as a mathematical exercise, if I were to go about doing such a thing, uh, would I have, I want to, uh, so in general the z's won't be related to each other, they'll only be related to the masses. They are quite independent of each other. Well, no, the, the, this z, yes. the idea here is that this z is associated with the field. Yes. The change in the mass is this delta m. Yes, so now if I have four different size in that <coughs> thing, right? If you think of this as four different sides, then you have four different z's. Four different z's corresponding to which I have four different masses, for example. So if you had four different masses, then you'd have four different delta m's. Yeah. So all I'm trying to say is that if I have z1, z2, z3, and z4, they will only be related by the boundary conditions to z1, m2, m3, and m4. And there won't be any relation between z1 and z2, no matter what I do. I don't know. I mean, I've never seen anybody do that. Um, the basic thing is, couldn't we go to an easier case where you just had two, yeah, that's two spinner fields mm -hmm. instead of four? Mm -hmm. But a anyway, the, the basic thing is that you want, you know how particles behave. Namely, the thing has a certain physical mass. It, um, and, and, and that tells you then what the propagator has to be uh, for a free particle. So you want your after renormalization to get back to your ordinary free particles, physical masses, and so forth. I mean, if these spinner, if if you have say two spinner fields like that, and in the potential they can couple to one another, then couldn't you potentially have products of z two, z one and z two, say appearing, or z two and z three, or z three and z four? And then they well, could be well, let's put it this way. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously, you can have anything. Want. Um, so, I mean, I, I do, look, this, this theory is complicated. <laughs> Why are we making it worse? <laughs> All right, but I've never heard anybody do that. So, All right, what we notice here, let's get back to this symmetry thing. What we notice here is this is a total derivative. This is d mu of this times the change in psi i plus this times d mu of the change of psi i. So this is altogether d mu 
of partial Lagrange density with respect to Ladinia psi i times the change in psi i. And we say that this is then d mu, j mu, and it's zero, and j mu is partial Lagrange density with respect to d mu psi i change in psi i. So this is this is the very nice formula that comes out for the um, current density associated with the symmetry of a Lagrange density under this transformation. Uh, all right, now let's see. I'm, I'm I think I'm skipping some things. This is my notes in detail. Now there's a, uh, some, some Weinberg that I thought I could follow without um, the explicit part. So that's the symmetry part. Now there are some semester, um, when we have such a uh, theory, we can define a charge, which is an integral of j0 d cubed x, and um, we have then uh, q dot would be an integral j0 dot d cubed x, but j0 dot this thing is j0 dot plus gradient of j, and so this is minus the integral of the divergence of j, and then this is minus the integral of j dot d, what, d sigma integrated over the surface, and um, you go to a surface at infinity and you assume that uh, or lack of funding or whatever, the current zero at, at infinity is, is something that always bothers me. But in any event, we're arguing that q dot is equal to zero, at least if j vanishes at infinity. Um, I mean, that's physically motivated. You can say that you know, a current density should be localized somehow. All right, if we're doing local experiments, everything should be localized. Yes, good. If it didn't go to zero at some point, it would, you would have an infinite amount of energy, right? Yeah. Well, so, but we, <laughs> well I guess that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I forgot. That problem's no, everywhere. That's, that's a, no, 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 that's nice, right? Because it should give another boundary condition for which you can, you can determine some other constant. I mean, after all, it's a game of finding boundary conditions right. and constants, right? Which can be mapped. Okay. No? All right, let me just do, let me just, All right, I, I can't answer all no, we're just arbitrary saying. questions. <laughs> so we have Q dot being zero because the currents are localized. That means the Q commutes with the Hamiltonian. Um, also, it's a, Q is a space integral. So under translations, nothing happens to Q. So zero is the commutator of Q with the momentum operator which generates translations. Moreover, um, Q is J0, Q, yeah, J0 d cubed x, so that makes it a scalar, time component, time space. That's a scalar under Lorentz transformations. So in other words, J mu nu, this now J has nothing to do with that J, it's a generator of Lorentz transformations. Uh, that uh, it's unvarying on the Lorentz transformations. And um, that means then that Q on the vacuum has to be proportional 
Um, it, it has to be a, a Lorentz invariant state, and since it commutes with, so the vacuum is Lorentz invariant, this is Lorentz invariant, so the thing here is Lorentz invariant. Since Q commutes with H and P, it can't change the momentum or the uh, energy of the vacuum, and if there's a unique vacuum, then, then Q on the vacuum has to be proportional to the vacuum. On the other hand, um, vacuum uh, J mu vacuum has to be zero because if it weren't zero, Lorentz, the invariance of the vacuum on the Lorentz transformations would mean we could stick in u dagger u, u dagger u, the u's hitting the vacuum would be, would, would, would just turn into identities. Then you'd have u dagger j u, that would turn this into a Lorentz transformed uh, uh, g matrix element, and if it weren't zero, then we'd have a contradiction. So this has to vanish. And um, on the other hand, if you replace, if you set mu equal to zero, integrate over space, then that says Q on the maximum is um, zero. So uh, the charge of the vacuum is zero. And one, one can further argue, I, I think, this, if we have some state of um, Does that mean Q is proportional to the lowering operator? No. Well, yeah, you know, that's, 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 in a certain sense, that's true. Um, it's, in fact, if you write Q, what is it? It's something like this. It's an integral of um, Q sub n a dagger. N is just a label of what kind of field. And uh, so let's suppose it's just one field. Then it really is. This is what it actually is. Right. All right. In any event, one argues then. Uh, this is in the notes that I put on Weinberg's notes. <laughs> um, and. Uh, so you can argue, similarly to the argument we gave here, that Q on a state is the charge times the state. Okay. And, and then uh, you can further show that J0, um, the current commuting with a field at equal time, this is minus the charge of the field and this is the this is the to derive or argue to. The reason is that this, if you're talking about a scalar field, then this is essentially a pi times a QL times a psi, and the commutation relations of pi with psi give you um, this expression, equal time commutation relations. And, um, Integrating over x, you get q with psi l of y and t is minus ql psi l of y and, and so forth. Um, now this current that we've been talking about is the, he writes it as a variational derivative. I don't know, I think you can equally well write it as a partial derivative. Um, and now if we look at the Lagrange density, it's minus a quarter d mu a bear mu minus d mu a bear mu d mu okay, and then plus some Matter Lagrangian, which involves, involves psi L, it's a function of psi L, and then the covariant derivative, d mu 
minus i q bare a bear, I'm leaving out the subscript L. L, let's just say this one. Well, all right, L. I think that we're actually building a lily here to some extent. Okay, so that, the Lagrange, not a Lagrange density is that. In the case, of course, of its psi bar, uh, gamma mu, d e mu minus i to a. It looks like this, and um, the, the all right. Um, so, if we differentiate with respect to a mu, this pulls down essentially a psi bar gamma mu q mu psi. So you get psi bar gamma mu q bar psi. If I put the L's in, it looks like this. So this is something. What J is, is, is essentially looks like. And now, oh, I'm sorry, this is the derivative with respect to the renormalized field. And if we say that A bear is um, square root of Z3, A renormalized then this would pull down the QB times, a, so this would be square root of Z3 Q bear, okay, times that. And but what, what, what we know is that we want this to be simply Q, psi bar L, gamma mu, psi L. At least if these are the renormalized spinner fields. So in other words, what we've got to have is that Q bear is 1 over square root of Z3 Q. And then the two constants here cancel. And so what you've got there is really the product of the charge times the renormalized field. All right. OK. now. All of this is basically related to what's called um, a war dynamic. All right, maybe we don't have time to do, we may or may not have time to do the war dynamic. Let me um, make a definition. Integral d4 of x, d4 of y, d4 of z, even minus i px, minus i ky, plus I L Z vacuum time ordered product J mu of X psi N of Y psi bar M of Z vacuum is and let me just say three lines definition minus I 2 pi to the fourth Q, the renormalized charge. Is, is that Z in the exponential supposed to, the last one, the last term in the exponential is supposed to be a plus, or is that also a minus? No, it is a plus. Okay. Conservation of typos. <laughs> Delta fourth of P plus K minus L. All right, so this is our definition where the S prime is the um, full uh, electron propagator, or fermion propagator more generally, and this um, S prime is defined as minus I 2 pi to the fourth S prime and M of K delta fourth of K minus L equals D fourth Y D fourth Z 
vacuum, time over product, psi, n of y, psi bar, m of z, vacuum, and then e to the minus i, ky plus i, lz. And in these expressions, what we're really thinking about is renormalized Heisenberg field operators with their full time dependence. That's uh, how we're thinking of these fields. Okay, so this is the expression here. Now, what is gamma? Where is gamma? Is that gamma? Ah, <laughs> this is the definition of gamma. Okay. Maybe I mean, that scene in um, that movie uh, about Frankenstein. Frankenstein Jr. or something? Young Frankenstein? Young Frankenstein, yeah. Gene, Marvel's movie. With Gene Wilder? Yes. Okay. So uh, here's the key thing. D by dx mu of the time one product of J mu of x. This is the thing that's inside here. Okay. Where am I? Inside there. J mu of x uh, psi n y psi bar m z. Okay, what is this? Well, if you, uh, apart from time ordering, you can just differentiate, and that gives you a zero. So you have d mu j mu. This is zero because this is a conserved current. Okay. But then there are other terms because of the time ordering. And, and when you differentiate the theta function, you get a delta function. So you get delta of x0 minus y0 times the time order product of the commutator of j0 of x with psi n of y times psi bar m of z plus delta of x0 minus z0 time ordered product of psi n of y j0 of x psi bar m of z. Now, no, the reason why you get a zero here is that if this is a spatial derivative and you have a spatial value of mu, then the spatial derivative doesn't screw around with the theta functions, and so there's no problem. So it's only the J0. And um, what you've got, the reason why you've got a commutator is that you had here a theta of x0 minus y0 times J0 psi n plus theta of y0 minus x0 psi n j0. And then that gives you this structure here and similarly down there. OK. The next thing is to substitute these into the, into the expression over there. This expression here. Well, what are that n and that? What are the primes on the n and the m in this expression? Okay. Where does come from? Oh, these are just this is just matrix multiplication. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's summed over. Okay. And these primes all mean the full propagate. All right. So what you get is the following: minus i times i p mu. 2 pi to the fourth q s prime n n prime of k gamma mu n prime m prime of k l s prime m prime m of l. By the way, I met Ward once at the uh, airport. Actually, visited Los Alamos. I drove out to the airport to talk to the world. I was changing the planes. 
where do you throw some pliers? Anyway, um, equals, okay, e fourth x, e fourth, so I'm just using the definition of this structure. d fourth z, e to the minus i, px minus i, ky, plus i, lz, and this is just d by dx mu of vacuum time ordered product j mu x psi n. So this, this is basically the definition plus, uh, actually I skipped a step. Um, in other words, if you integrate by parts, you have minus the derivative on this, and then you go around and you get this. Now you use this expression for what the derivative is, and that means that this is equal to e fourth x d fourth y d fourth c e to the minus i px minus i k y plus i l z um, times vacuum and then big parentheses minus q delta fourth of x minus y uh, time ordered product psi m y psi bar and this is an m z plus q delta 4 x minus z time one of the psi m y psi bar m z so these are the, the factors that's going on um, Let's see, why? This was obvious to me when I wrote this down, but I don't quite see why the, why, where I got the spatial delta function. Oh, oh. Sorry, I left something out. Um, we're using now the commutation relation of J0 with psi and J0 with psi here. This throws out a Q and a delta of X minus Y. So in other words, I'm yeah, using this formula there. right here. That formula kicks out uh, these things. And now what you can see is that this turns it into minus q integral d fourth y d fourth z e to the minus i p plus k y plus i l z vacuum time order psi n psi n y psi n bar z and again I should have factored it plus Q, integral, same thing, same thing, vacuum, same thing. Uh, so you see no, the no, 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 it's not quite the same thing. This one is E to the minus I KY plus I L minus P Z. Okay, what, what that gives you then, now using this definition over here, namely the the full propagator is this Fourier transform of the time order product of two Heisenberg uh, spinner fields. That means that this thing is minus Q minus I to pi to the four um, delta fourth of P plus K minus L. And I'm going to try to factor this on the fly, and it's S prime NM of P plus K minus S prime NM of K. Right. All right. 
And so altogether, that is, because of the double functions, in other words, what we've got is, the left-hand side is this thing. And the P is required to be K minus L. And then over here, P plus K has to be L. And altogether, I'm trying to find some black support to write this down. Maybe I'll just write it here. What you get then is the following. L minus K mu S prime N N prime of K gamma mu N prime M prime of K and L S prime M prime M of L is I S prime N M of L minus I S prime N M of K. Okay, so this is called the generalized uh, Ward Takahashi identity. What is the not generalized one? <laughs> The not generalized form is the original one that Ward wrote down, and uh, it's a lot easier to write down. It's uh, you, you let L approach K. Will you? I'll, I'll pick up this next time and show you that it gives you gamma mu of K K is minus I partial with respect to K lower mu of S prime inverse K. So basic, basically the derivative of the inverse propagator is, uh, all of this is, that's equal to the vertex function. So this thing's called the vertex function? Yes. And that has, uh, so what's the significance of this thing? Is it related to the to the circles over here at all? The, the, the vertex function is it's if you have an electron line going in, coming out, and a photon line going in, and then any gen So it's related to, to these circles? Well, no, not really, because those circles just have two external lines. These have three external lines. So this is the this is the thing that uh, let's put it this way. If this is on the mass shell and this is a photon, then this describes what the full interaction is of the photon with the electron. And as you let the momentum of the photon go to zero, so you're you're probing the static charge of the fermion. Then Ward's identity over here tells you that uh, this is effectively gamma mu simply. In other words, this goes to gamma mu on the mass shell, uh, and K is on the mass shell. I see, it's modified. Yeah, I see. Um, all right, well, we'll pick this up next time. Um, it's 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 overly complicated and I shouldn't say overly complicated, but it's um, it's a little complicated. These indices, by the way, n and m, these things are going from one to four. These are the indices in the, the, the gamma matrix is four by four. Oh, okay, they're not different. Species. Yeah, they're not different species. Of all right, does any, I, owe, I must owe somebody a chocolate. Who, 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 who wants chocolate? Jason, you want chocolate? Yeah. Yeah, it's not Jason. Huh?